Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Welcome along to the vlog. So what are we up to today? Well, first brew day of a new week. It's Tuesday though, obviously. You saw yesterday's video, right? And something that caught me out on the previous brew day last week, week before was it? I can't remember now, was the HLT temps. So because we'd had the HLT and everything out for the floor painting, when I pushed it back in, we put the probes in. In fact, I improved on the probes because now it's sealed to the elements in a specific gland, if you like, to make it watertight and probably heat tight as well. So a little less chance for the heat to wick away in the air, kind of giving us a more accurate reading, you would hope. But alas, we had a low mash temperature because of that very issue. So the transfer onto the thermoprobe was better, meaning the control panel thought it was at a higher temperature than it actually was. So, oh, I've just spent five minutes balancing that thermometer up there so I could see it and it's fallen over. Anyway, long story short, it thought that the temperature was higher than it was and that meant we uh, mashed in low. So we've got 72 degrees reading on there. Let's go back up here. 71.7, that's good enough for the girls I go out with, 71.8. So that tells me that the temperature in the tank is what the temperature on the control panel says, which is what we want to see. So we've got probably 10, 15 minutes before this hits 79, which is what I want to mash in with today. And in that time, it'll give me opportunity to weigh out my water treatment which we've got a few salts to go in, calcium chloride, calcium sulfate, AMS into the HLT and a splash of lactic acid for the mash and also put some parasitic acid into the boil kettle and the reason we're going to do that as you already know is to sanitise the whole thing before we make beer. Even though it's going to be boiled I like to do it as a precaution. So this has had a massive clean in place uh, routine. So it's had caustic in there, it's been rinsed and it's ready to go. So the acid will sanitize any of the pipe work. You know, you never know, we could have had a spider crawl in there or something. They'll also flush that kind of stuff out. And more importantly, if there's any caustic left over, there shouldn't be. But if by chance there is, the acid will neutralize it, of course. So there we go, that's today's intro, I'm making the vacant gesture if you've not already guessed, so we may as well crack on with it, haven't we? So I keep all my salts, if you like, down here in these big old buckets to keep the moisture off of them for a start. Now the calcium sulphate or gypsum you may know it by tends not to be as hydrophilic as the calcium chloride and that basically means that if you leave the lid off of the calcium sulphate then it isn't necessarily going to cause you a problem so 177 grams of this whereas if you leave the lid off the calcium chloride it will suck moisture out of the air and clump, making it really quite difficult to use as a water addition because it won't dissolve as readily. And they use calcium chloride in uh, the, oh I've forgotten the name of them now, dehumidifiers. That's right. So you get these dehumidifiers that sit in the window. 122 grams of this. And that's how they work. There's no moving parts. 
there's no electricity incorporated into them they just suck moisture out the air with the uh, well the calcium chloride wants it basically it wants the moisture and then you can recharge these things you can tip the water out if it's got any in the bottom and then you can tip out your that's too much you can tip out your calcium chloride crystals into a metal tray one two two and you can pop it in the oven and recharge them there we go free little lesson for you there I'm just it's, it's all filler really one thing I did want to mention before I bugger off over there and add the water additions is with this ANS right don't get it on your stainless steel if you've got any because it eats it and the way I found that out was you might have noticed that I was wielding a 25 litre drum there to try and team a little bit of this stuff into a jug and the reason I'm doing that and I don't have one of these in the top like a handy little pump action dose thing which I've got on all of my other chemicals so I don't have to pick the drums up is because the ANS or AMS will eat stainless steel until it's gone and it just leaves like it turns it into like a powder and completely dissolves any structural integrity that the stainless steel has and if you spill it on your worktops like I have done in the past here quite a bit it stains it you probably can't see from where you are but there are loads of little stains where it started to go to work on it and then obviously I've come along and mopped it up there we go so just uh, just a little bit of info there be careful with this stuff so it's a it's a stainless steel gobbler for sure it's been quite a good day today I know we've jumped mainly from me weighing out kind of water treatment to bingo brew day is just about done we're almost ready to pop in the whirlpool hops into the boil let me just put the camera down so the whirlpool hops are going to go into the boil when we hit 80 degrees we're at 88 at the minute these are the whirlpoolers check them beauties out 500 grams of mosaic and then we're also in the process of taking out the best bitter from tank number six and that's going to go into all of it it's going to go into cask today can you see me up here i think you can camera's probably pointing in the wrong direction but yeah we're up there now we can see Gemma's just getting the casks out and we will be filling them up but she's gonna to have to go at some point it's almost approaching the school run in the afternoon so she'll go and pick Abigail up and then I'll take over and just pull out whatever's left into cask isn't that right Gem? they can hear me look somewhere in my new microphone I thought you'd finished. No, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, I've got. Well, I've had it for a few months now, but I very rarely put it on. It's a wireless lapel, yeah. A road mic, no less. R O D E, road, yeah. Anyway, and now I've given away my secrets, haven't I? I may as well show you what I've got on, seeing as this is going to probably become a talking point in the comments. So this is the little fella here and that's a wireless lapel mic and then just connected to the camera over here is the receiver and as you can see I'm talking into the wireless bit and the receiver is bouncing up and down as it should so I'll just clip that back I just clip that to the top of the uh, the fluffy dead cat mic at the top of the camera and this can clip on there and hopefully you can hear me while I'm walking around the brewery that was the idea anyway because I noticed when I'm over here and the pumps running and I've got the camera set up just over there you ain't gonna hear me 
Right, it's a good job I walked down here actually because I have to change the direction as to which this beer is flowing back into the tank. So in order to get a good uh, chill for the whirlpool and not have any thermal stratification or layering in the tank, what I like to do is recirculate through the takeoff hose and into the top of the tank. That's one way of doing it. And then I've got a whirlpool arm in there as well, but that whirlpool arm is below halfway at the bottom of the tank. So by using swapping from one to the other, I can chill the top half of the tank and I can chill the bottom half of the tank independently. And the whirlpool arm at the bottom really gets it pushing around, so I like to finish on that one. So we, we have a good kind of whirlpool in the tank. And when I put the hops in, that means that they're gonna be buzzing around as well. And then hopefully we form like a little cone in the bottom when all the debris stops rotating and settles out. And that will lay below the takeoff tube, which I've got coming off the side of the tank. And then we'll unclip the transfer hose, we'll connect it to the fermenter, and then we'll start to transfer through the plate chiller again into the fermenter at around 18 degrees and uh, hopefully leaving all of the trube and bits and bobs in the boil kettle. And then at the end we'll just open the bottom of the boil kettle up, two valves on the bottom there, and we'll dump it all out and wash it, put some caustic in, give it a clean, all that kind of thing. I'm sure that makes sense, doesn't it? I think so. So as one tank empties, another one fills. And uh, the bonus of that is, oh yeah, little 10 litre keg to take home. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> Best bitter. So, nothing too special, but it is a delicious beer and well, it would only have gone down the drain anyway. I know you might think, 10 litres down the drain. But sometimes anything that's kind of at that level tends to be, uh, tends to be dumped because we don't have any packaging immediately to hand that'll take anything less than 10 litres. So if I can stick it in something like that, then generally I will. Or I could do like a milk carton of two litres or something like that, take it home. But generally dump and it's also most of the time quite trubby because we are getting to like what you'd class as the bottom of the tank in fact I'm going to show you I'm going to take you off the tripod let me just make sure that this is all set up correctly it's looking good just want to start a recirc with some rinse water just like that and we'll push that through the plate chiller. There we go. So while that's recirculating, let's take off the tripod. Let's go and have a look what we've done. So here I am behind the camera. We've got 12 casks out of it. So, you know, our brew length's 500 litres, but we don't really get uh, 500. We get about 480 out the tanks. And that's where, depending on whether it's the conical shallow cones or the deep cones, that depends on how much extra we tend to get. So let's go and have a look at the tank we've just emptied, which is this one. And I'm anticipating seeing the dip tube. Well, there we have it. So it looks like a lot of beer in there. It does really, doesn't it? But if I send that dip tube any deeper there's a massive chance of us grabbing big chunks of trub and just kind of uh, ruining whatever what other um, vessel of beer we can salvage out of it and if you look at all this on the edge as well the crowns and ring all looks pretty cool though doesn't it but yeah I suppose if I had a corny keg here today which I don't I could fill a corny keg and probably get 
almost 20 litres out of that. But it is what it is, and you can see from this side, the cone, reducing down to this one, to nothing, just about. So there isn't actually all that much beer left in there, if you look at it from this side. And it is what it is. Wastages are different for the different sizes of kit. For instance, when I was on the big kit at Idle Valley, the 2000 litre one, sometimes you'd lose as much as 40 litres of beer through packaging and uh, spillage and that kind of stuff. Which, yeah, sounds like a heck of a lot. But, you know, we're not, uh, we're not stovetop brewing it. You know, it's just the next level up. Not the top, just the next level up. Right, I need to set this place, this, uh, this place, I need to set this equipment up for a CIP overnight. And uh, that'll be me going home today. Another job done, brewing the bag. <laughs> Not quite. I've also set these to chill, so to prevent any suction, I've put, uh, I've taken the, the tubes off, but I've also put some head pressure on them. I'm just going to charge these back up again because they've dropped a little bit. So the temps have uh, started to decrease nicely. This one was at 22, this was at 20, this was at 20, so it's about two degrees behind the rest of them. So they're all chilling at pretty much the same rate. This chiller I've now set it to minus five so it should be able to get down a little bit cooler and bring this down. I want all this down to four degrees, that's the plan. So we'll come in tomorrow and see exactly where we are with that. Hopefully, putting about 15 PSI is enough head pressure to prevent the all-rounders from imploding. If not, we'll find out in the morning, won't we? Uh, but they can't go too far because, of course, there's only a certain amount of headspace on these anyway. So, a little bit of shrinkage, maybe a litre of shrinkage of the liquid itself. And then if I put 15 PSI in there, I'm sure there's going to be enough pressure in the headspace. I'm sure of it. So, not being one to waste perfectly good beer, indeed, I've decided to clean up the old kegerator and shove that best bitter in there for safekeeping. So I've got a little creamer head on one of the uh, tap spouts. Now this beer hasn't been carbonated apart from what you saw me do in the brewery, just throw it around a little bit. So we're gonna use a little bit of force. See if we can't get a little bit of body. Let's just have a look how this comes out. Oh, I think this is gonna work. So obviously the beer ain't ain't clear because it uh, it's just come out of the fermenter today. Oh look at that! There's not a lot of gas for it to knock out, actually, is there? But I think that's looking something like. Oh, I'm very pleased. And there we have it. You can't really get fresher ale than that, frankly. So I think I'll finish there. Cheers. Wow. See you on the next one.